Anyway, Rob, well, last, not, last but not least, this is our final speaker of the day and indeed of the forum. It's uh, Jonas Tinius. I got to know uh, Jonas in his final year as a PhD student in Cambridge. Uh, where we spent Wednesday mornings indulging in very competitive games of squash. Uh, he now has a prestigious uh, postdoctoral research fellowship at the Centre for Anthropological Research on Museums and Heritage at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Now, interestingly, and this has come up in earlier conversation, Jonas is not an art historian, but an anthropologist uh, working on art and artistic practice, so it will be really interesting to his, hear, hear his perspective. His talk is entitled, After All... Oh, you changed the title of the talk. Experimental Relations, Fieldwork Dynamics, and the Anthropologist as Sparring Partner. Jonas, please proceed. Well, thank you so much, James, Vid, and Karun, of course, for all this wonderful organization. I think that you can't reiterate all the thanks um, uh, uh, for all the wonderful effort that has gone into this. And also, of course, many thanks to the Rubinoff family and um, everybody who's been um, close to him and is close to the, the estate now and is really making sure that it's it's going to stay as alive as, it, as, it, as it's felt over the last few days. Um, I've really appreciated the last few days, actually, and it's sort of uh, both an honor and uh, a, a difficult thing to speak at the very end of, a, um, of, of two wonderful days, and in fact, more days of conversations, because it's really been just very inspiring and um, aesthetically incredibly pleasing. Um, I also wanted to say um, thanks to the Hornby residents and those that have come to the island to see this. I think this is um, it's just wonderful to be on top of a hill overlooking this landscape. Um, and in a in an interesting way, I realized that there was something strangely familiar about the island and maybe the park, um, despite me never having been here. And I think that may have to do with the fact that I spent three years as an undergraduate in Churchill College um, in Cambridge. And I heard that the former master of Churchill College, um, David Wallace, was here in this park um, just a few years ago, last year, two years ago. Two years ago. And for those of you who don't know Churchill College, it's the National Memorial to Winston Churchill, but it's also an incredibly interesting, um, brutalist um, uh, college, uh, one of the uh, youngest colleges in Cambridge. Uh, I think it's just over 50 years old now. And it has essentially something which you could call a sculpture park. I mean, some say that the buildings themselves looks like, look like Churchill cigar stacks, um, but they are themselves really allowing for these sorts of vistas of light um, that um, we've been enjoying here as well. I also must admit that I had originally written a paper with the title that James read out, um, but that I decided the day before yesterday, um, after a beautiful walk along Heliwell, um, Heliwell Coast walk, um, um, and a long conversation with Vid during that walk, that I would write a different paper. Um, and um, that... <laughs> um, <laughs> he basically took it apart, and that, um, and, um, that uh, writing that paper wasn't necessarily too easy because there were so many wonderful activities that included lots of great wine and, um, uh, and gin tonics and beautiful views um, into the stars and so on. So that, um, well, I, I did find some time um, to write something. And um, in, a, in a sense, the paper that I've now written, um, which has a longish title, but um, will, uh, you'll see what, what some of those terms mean, is in a way kind of a reflection actually on the on the way in which all of you have been speaking about your relationships with one another, but also your relationship to um, Jeffrey Rubinoff. And I feel that um, the paper that I've written now um, kind of reflects perhaps the, the, the way in which as theoretical and as abstract some of the concerns that Jeffrey um, um, uh, was interested in and as abstract and theoretical some of the themes were that we've been speaking about, there's always that very personal... Um, element of relating to a human being, because after all, it's whether art is digital or very concrete, um, it's human beings that create those um, that create those artworks, whether mediated through technology and so on. And as an anthropologist, I feel that the human being is the subject of my study and the relationships that human beings have to one another. One another. Um, and so I suppose that what I'm going to be talking about um, uh, reflects some of that, um, because what I'll be speaking about is a reflection on my own personal engagement with some of my most cherished um, fieldwork interlocutors in the arts. And I'm sort of using this personal reflection to speak to the broader relationship of art and anthropology, art and knowledge. And the paper is in two parts. The first will be tackling uh, my work with migrant theater directors in um, an area of Germany that I 
come from. And the second part, if time allows, um, will be about my current work with the major museum redevelopments in uh, Germany's capital in Berlin and my collaborative relations to curators that are dealing with um, essentially the future of Germany's heritage and as it's being projected and exhibited um, in new museum developments in Berlin. Right, you see the title? Experimental Relations, Fieldwork Dynamics and the Anthropologist's Aspiring Partner. But yet before I go into it, let me begin with some basics. So when I speak today and when I speak of what I do um, as anthropology, I'm here referring mostly to what um, is known in uh, the UK as social and in the US as cultural anthropology with its variants of ethnology in Germany and France. And the anthropology I'm referring to here is not the historical, physical, biological or archaeological type of anthropology that looks at skulls and bones, genes and evolution. And it's not the philosophical or phenomenological one which attends to the nature of human being, of the human being, its psyche or definitions, universal definitions of what it means to be human either. The, the kind of anthropology that I'm referring to here is what you could describe as the comparative study of human beings in their environments today, examined through the anthropologist's own immersion in those people's lives, um, their participant observation, um, of an entanglement in these kinds of lives. Um, so when people ask me what period I work in, for instance, that's just absurd to me because it's it's the now. Um, and what is more, but this is just kind of a side note, uh, my very own understanding of anthropology has been one not of the study of far away or other cultures or societies, because I've always felt that the idea of something far away is relative anyway, far away from where. Um, and for a long time, that far away has been dictated from a Euro-American point of view, where it's been about Europe and the rest, essentially. And I think that that, that is part of our work that we need to question. Um, I've studied my own society and culture, contemporary Western, post-reunification Germany. And I've even gone as far as studying, um, as I did for my PhD, theater in the city that I grew up in. Um, I've, and that's not been easy to, uh, to tell to other anthropologists that still believe that you need to go and experience the, uh, the very unfamiliar. Um, um, and I've since been working with curators in Berlin, focusing on how they deal with notions of alterity and otherness in the drastically changing museum and heritage landscape, um, of the city that I live in. Um, a city that I will be spending the next four and a half years at least in. And I feel that this kind of work on one's own society contributes in a way to something which um, the philosopher Raymond Goys um, has described as um, um, a, a sort of approach to one's own society that sees theory and knowledge production as integral to the way in which we live together. So not as something abstract um, that is that doesn't have anything to do with our everyday lives, but as something very much integrated with it. Um, right. So this paper um, that I'm going to give to you now reflects on fieldwork dynamics in a collaborative art and theatre project with refugees um, in abandoned refugee housing complexes in the post-industrial German Ruhr Valley. Based on more than three years of on and off fieldwork, I'm going to outline some of the ways in which I've been experimenting with this project on creating, um, on the one hand, site-specific installations and performances in former refugee camps, or as I called it with colleagues um, in a special issue on, um, on, on this theme that I circulated beforehand, how we engaged with socially engaged art as a form of relational micro-utopia. Um, today I focus explicitly and deliberately on a meta-level reflection on the kinds of relations this collaboration engendered between me and my key interlocutors and not on the kinds of artworks we sought to create. Um, and I said, uh, as I said, ideally, if I have time, I'll get to my current work as well. In May 2013, I began my doctoral fieldwork in the Western German post-industrial Ruhr Valley, where I had begun documenting and researching the daily, labor, the daily labor processes at a famous public city theater, the Theater an der Ruhr, which is right next to the Ruhr, which is a large river that flows into the Rhine, um, just an hour north of Cologne, for those of you that have been in this part of the, Germany. German public theatres, like uh, this one, um, as some of you may know, build on an almost 200-year-old um, Enlightenment tradition of German public edu education and state art patronage, um, in German encapsulated in the term Bildung, which regards theatres as significant sites for self-cultivation through the arts. Um, German public theatres were also crucial in terms of nation-building, 
um, uh, Germany having been fragmented and, as some of you know, turbulently decentralized over its modern existence. So these theaters were seen by famous playwrights like Friedrich Schiller, for instance, as sites that could bring together the German nation. And these institutions still play a central role today, and they share a strange kind of responsibility. On the one hand, they are tasked with being something like the critical and autonomous artistic counterpart to official party politics, um, meant and allowed to mock the state and mock the mayor, etc. These are frequent uh, uh, things that you would find in these theaters. Um, they're sort of seen as a bourgeois public sphere, in the words of Jürgen Habermas. On the other hand, these sorts of theaters are closely tied to local schools, um, like the ones that my, my father worked in, for instance, um, often offering seminars in practical acting or more theoretical discussions of canonical texts that are part of the German curriculum. And I was fascinated when I began this study with how an institution um, actually combines in everyday practice these tasks of acting as pedagogic institutions in the spirit of the Enlightenment, all the while not giving up their aspirations um, to critical and professional contemporary theatre. Um, an idea that very much rests um, on this notion of autonomy, the, the autonomy of art. Initially, I entered the institution by doing the usual stuff of ethnography, uh, like interviewing the gatekeepers, here with the um, uh, by now 84-year-old Italian director, Roberto Ciulli, key actors, local funders, etc. And basically, in the famous words of American anthropologist Clifford Geertz, who summed up ethnographic methods very well, I basically did deep hanging out um, in the institution. Um, this is a, uh, a little more intense deep hanging out, um, but uh, <laughs> anyway, eventually though as trust built up, um, I spent about a year and a half in this institution on a daily basis. I was invited to partake in the closed rehearsals and gradually introduced um, to more and more intimate circles of acquaintances and commitments, which led me to accompany the theatre on its travels to Europe and North Africa, um, and in Germany to more in-depth studies of the corporeal and conceptual kind of political self-cultivation that characterized the rehearsals and labor at this institution. Uh, the photo taken here, for instance, was from just a month ago, um, during one of a set of interviews the director and I have been doing together on the institution and its past. And in the background at the top, you see um, playbills of this, um, of, of this single institution's the last 35 years worth of plays that this um, director um, directed there. It was about six months into my fieldwork that one of the key director's um, um, assistants, um, the Croatian-born um, woman on the, uh, that you see on the right-hand side, Diana Brinic, introduced me to Adam Kusterili, who's the other guy um, with the beard. Um, Adam worked then in the lower ranks of a large multinational steel corporation, ThyssenKrupp, an old family dynasty from the Ruhr Valley. But interestingly, he had been affiliated with the Theater an der Ruhr that I just showed you since his youth and deeply admired their work, um, especially the particular aesthetic of its founding director, Roberto Ciulli, pictured here with um, Adam in the Theater an der Ruhr. And the plays that both of these were fascinated with were inspired by a dance artist that some of you may have heard of, um, Pina Bausch, um, who actually practiced and lived not very far from this theater and collaborated with um, these, these artists, which is a kind of theater that is um, so-called post-traumatic theater, so it's not just an enactment of texts, um, but it's essentially a kind of performance that is, while still recognizable as theater on a dark stage with an audience, etc., cetera, um, focused very much on, on movements and lighting, um, instead of just straight, straightforward enactments of texts. Adam um, had remained affiliated th with the theater throughout his early career at um, the Steel Corporation and had begun working with marginalized youth and migrant kids in the region. Mülheim, uh, the city in which this theater is based, it has to be set for context, um, is surrounded by some of the most desolate and financially distraught um, post-industrial cities in the Ruhr Valley, um, and it's only really being beginning to be repurposed um, as part of a larger post-industrial heritage transformation, where now these former factories are being turned into museums and, and performance venues and so on. So in October 2013, Adem um, approached me after a public event um, at which he was invited to speak about migrants and theater. And he was visibly annoyed about the public display of projects with refugees that political parties and other cultural institutions use to display essentially their own inclusiveness and critical edge. 
Um, he was upset about how precarious populations, um, to use a term coined by Judith Butler, became essentially self-authenticating subjects on stage whose artistic value relied almost entirely on their own tragic narratives rather than on stories that would not equate the actors with the roles and characters that they played. There are so many empty shops, scattered industrial spaces and empty warehouses, he said to me, which we can use to tell powerful stories of belonging, of relocation, um, and of aspirations um, uh, that people might have who move to a new um, environment. And I was struck, struck by his way of speaking about these spaces, especially because I knew just how much some of these derelict buildings um, characterized the experience of being in these rural valley cities. And as it happened, we found out that on the same building, uh, this one that you see, um, which houses on the ground floor the rehearsal spaces for this um, theater that I was studying for over a year and a half, um, on the other floors had been um, essentially empty floors that were empty for about 20 years that had been used at some point as former refugee quarters, but that nobody knew about. Um, so as I said, the building had been empty for a good 25 years, um, except for the ground floor. Um, but what was more, some of these, uh, fl some of the floors on this building, a vast building with uh, several tens of thousands of square meters of space overlooking an industrial harbor, had been used in the 1990s to house refugees um, who fled from the Yugoslav Wars um, to Germany. So individual rooms um, had housed families. And many of the children's marks um, were still left on the walls. You could see names and drawings, etchings um, that were still left in the space. And if you look closely, you can see that on the floor, there were still marks of the former um, uh, quarters and, uh, and rooms that were in this particular room, which we turned into a stage. And so Adam was so inspired by these traces of former lives that he got two performing artists, an actor and a dramaturg, uh, on board on his project, who subsequently devised the plan for turning these floors and former living quarters into an immersive installation with listening stations of interviews with former inhabitants and guards that they conducted and other artistic interventions. Um, over the course of the process, a short film was shot which illustrated the haunted nature of this space and various performances with refugee actors and visitors kind of brought this space temporarily back to life. Uh, this was from a rehearsal and I think this shot kind of captures the eerie nature. You can imagine working in this space um, late at night and, you know, just hearing sounds a little bit like the crowd that flew flew by yesterday. Um, and as part of the, this is another shot from a rehearsal, as part of our effort to raise funds for the project, uh, we met with the artistic director of the theater that would act as its patron and discussed ways to make the project appealing uh, to funders. I asked if I could join the meeting since, I said, uh, I was very curious to see just how a project actually gets started right from the very first day, how you write an application for this um, project, how you plan it, etc., etc. They agreed to have me in the meeting, and as we were discussing possible ways of outlining the project, it occurred to them that it would perhaps, that we could just write into the application that an anthropologist should be accompanying the whole process documenting um, the rehearsals, but also the conflicts and dilemmas you face when conducting such a project. And in recording from that first meeting, um, Adam, the young director who was going to lead the project, um, commented on this idea by saying that I've never been able to observe my own practices, and I really hope that this could even feed back into my project again. So in a sense, they were looking for someone that could really throw, essentially, a look back at their own practices, which they hadn't been able to do before. So to cut a long story short, we ended up adding an accompanying anthropologist into the project application, which you can see here, um, which was successful in the end, um, and meant that I was able to follow this project um, over the course of, uh, in this case, a year and a half. But since I was essentially the only person who could commit full-time to the project, having been on fieldwork to research political theatre, I became something like Adam's production partner, I became a speaker for the project for the local press, for whom I wrote a weekly column about the project, uh, which was also a wonderful way for me, actually, to get to know some of the participants. Um, and eventually, Adam asked me what I thought of decisions of his. We discussed the plays in his car while driving home some of the participants to their camps in the nearby cities. But I also helped him edit the official texts on the website, press releases, and sometimes spoke with other politicians or academics interested in the process. 
A few times I even represented the project in official negotiations, uh, uh, in this case with the Secretary of Cultural Affairs um, from the city, who's here pictured, uh, kind of observing me very critically on the left-hand side. Um, and um, um, as, <laughs> as well as um, other members of parliament, as here, for instance, the woman in the white um, is, um, is an MP for Cultural Affairs of the Greens in the German Bundestag. And I never in these instances hid my role as the anthropologist accompanying the project, but I also did not shy away from admitting that I was probably the person who was closest to the project and knew best about the processes, the aims, and its, its, its aesthetics since I was there almost um, 24 hours. So in the installation which audience members could visit as part of the performance when it premiered uh, in June 2014, eventually they asked me to curate a room of my own, which isn't very spectacular but because we had limited budget. But in this room, uh, this room was an interesting example because um, they had essentially created a large archive of the history of this place. they have been looking for newspaper articles about former inhabitants and so on. But this room in particular, they felt, should feature my field notes, diaries, diary entries from rehearsals, newspaper cutouts from articles that I'd written, and excerpts from texts that I had published. Um, and there were interesting moments in there where I really thought, you know, my supervisors had told me, look, try not to engage too much in the field. You've got to stay the fly on the wall. You're an anthropologist. You don't get too engaged. But this was an instance really in which my presence was, was asked for. Um, and it would have really severed relationships with the people that I worked had I said, look, I can't, you know, I can't do anything here. Um, but there was an interesting moment, kind of like this critic anthropology moment that I mentioned earlier, where Adam asked me, so look, should I list you as a dramaturg or as an anthropologist or as an artist? How should I list you in this project? Kind of underlining the extent to which I'd become a collaborator and interlocutor for him. So once the project was over, I also began writing things up, ethnographically as we say, and started publishing papers, which obviously were of immediate interest to the project, um, and it's by then enlarged crew, because they were in the midst of applying for the next year, um, uh, for the next year's uh, funding, and used these writings that I had done to actually apply for some of these. So it was a very clever way um, that, they, that they used some of my involvement. I agreed to have them use my writings, because I felt that the observations that I contributed to the project had it themselves become a significant part of it. Um, Adam had, in the meantime, also become a friend and interlocutor who called me to discuss the project even while I was away in another country. Um, he drew on my observations, on our conversations, and my writings became aspects of the project that he and his collaborators discussed. But of course, as the next next project began, and this uh, whole uh, this whole thing actually became more serious with the intent, with the uh, sort of increasing intensity of the refugee crisis in Germany too, conflicts also began to emerge. Um, so I was back in the UK by then, uh, a year later, writing up my PhD, and could no longer be as present as I was during the first project. I then realised that my commitments that I had made. Um, a definition of fieldwork that I draw from the UCL anthropologist Danny Miller, it's a series of commitments we make to other people, were taken more seriously perhaps than I had taken them. Um, in other words, I had created a kind of promise of presence, of a presence, that I could not uphold. I could not, and in fact also did not want to sever the ties that I had to my field, and so I tried to find ways in which I could continue my role as a collaborator. So I began presenting at conferences about the project, as I do right now, for instance, and sent Adam photos and texts, mentions of the papers, and responses to them, so that they could show just how far their ideas had traveled. Uh, and this was a nice uh, moment when I told them about it, uh, and they present some of it on their websites, which is sort of a way in which they regularly do it. Um, and check out their website, it's got um, lots of interesting stuff in English too on it. Um, but this negotiation of proximity um, was not just professional, it was also effective and emotional. So Adam and I had begun considering each other as friends, and it was difficult for both of us, um, um, though for other reasons more difficult for him, to fill the void of a committed full-time anthropologist who had become part of an artistic project that he had just begun, including all kinds of social local commitments that he had made and from which I could essentially escape to go somewhere else, but he couldn't because he was committed to it locally. So the collaborative practices that we espoused, um, especially the proximity and the eventual integration of artistic and anthropological work, enabled me a kind of effective closeness to Adam's position, 
Um, and to reflect the role of the artist in such kinds of projects uh, that I would not have been able to do had I just um, been studying this from afar, for instance, or through texts that they've produced. And yet, this kind of engagement continuously raised questions about the role of anthropology. I became, for instance, fully aware of the rules and limits to my own ethnographic work that I didn't think I, um, uh, I would have realized had I not been so close. I began switching off my recording device more often than before, since I realized that we'd begun speaking, for instance, more and more about his family problems and his job, and I didn't want to break our trust. I also realized that I needed to be clearer now that I was away from the field with what I could contribute to it, um, where I seemed to do things for my own professional development, for instance, that didn't seem immediately relevant to him. I also, in a sense, began to need to translate the affordances of academic work into the language and temporality and life world of someone who wasn't an academic. This included explaining, for instance, why certain texts took so long to be published in his view, um, and I had to explain that, look, academic journals uh, aren't read by anyone and they take ages to publish and you can't access them and so on. Uh, it's, it's something that he just didn't understand, for the right reasons, I think. Um, or why I chose a certain kind of language to speak to academic peers rather than to him and to um, local residents of the city to describe the practices of the project. So over time, specifically over the next two years, while I wrote up my PhD in the UK and eventually uh, settled into a new job in Berlin, I continued to accompany the project, albeit in very different ways. I'd become officially the associated researcher uh, on the one hand, and a very good friend of Adam um, and the rest of his team, uh, which had by 2016 um, been managed to uh, managed to um, uh, attain over 200,000 euros of funding, so it had grown into um, a serious project. Um, the project itself had gone well beyond creating a single installation. This is an example from one of them with local residents. Uh, this is an, an abandoned um, former women's prison that had also um, functioned as a refugee shelter for a while. The project had begun, had, had, had gone well beyond just a single project and had become a long-term collective that is really um, now a, a significant player in the city that it was founded in because it negotiates between civil society organizations, local churches, um, urban planners, and the city. Um, it had become what I call in another publication sort of an interstitial agent um, that wasn't there before. And so in a sense, and this is connected closer to the theme of this particular forum, my role shifted from that of a local collaborator, a practical partner who could help with lots of things, to an epistemic partner, no longer present as an ethnographer, but as a member of an artistic collective that could help reflect on some of their aims. So as time went by and the current project uh, received sufficient funding to go ahead with more projects, other academic members also joined the collective, suddenly making me one, one academic among others. Um, and in U.S. anthropologist Dominic Boyer's words, my epistemic jurisdiction began overlapping with that of other intellectuals who were also trying to describe the project. But instead of seeing this as a problem, we began cooperating in different ways, giving talks together, for instance, and writing papers collaboratively about the project, in a sense like what, is, what James has edited with this book about um, Jeffrey's work, for instance. My perspective was no longer there for the, only, uh, the one and only academic or intellectual critical reflexive voice, but I became the person who could contribute the anthropological angle. So just um, a month ago, for instance, I conducted another kind of ethnographic experiment when I invited one of the artists in the group to join me for a conference in Belgium, where I basically, instead of giving a paper, uh, interviewed him on stage as a kind of performance-like dialogue, um, which was quite convenient because I'd been meaning to interview him anyway, and so we could sort of join um, our interests in that of the conference. So the reason why I'm saying all of this is because I felt it necessary to tell my relation to this field site um, and to these interlocutors of mine as a very personal story of change, uh, of dynamics, and also of failure to some extent. Um, fieldwork relations between artists and anthropologists um, are not static relations of exchange where I take something from you and I learn about you, and uh, etc. Um, and they're certainly not ones that play out just over a few weeks, um, and this is a crucial point, but steadily change um, as anthropologists move um, along uh, through fieldwork ethnography and reception of our work. So in fact, ethnographic immersion and participant observation 
are really no longer sufficient to describe what is going on in these kinds of epistemic partnerships um, and the dispersed and volatile sites that we may work in. Um, they're a lot less about relations with others and familiar and from other cultural settings and more about common agendas that we can create together. And I think this is not least the case because I consider my approach um, as part of a broader revision um, currently underway in anthropological work um, with artists, which considers itself as collaborative and recursive. That is to say, an anthropology that considers the artistic fields it engages with as important sites for the kind of reflexive theorizing that is pertinent to core anthropological debates themselves. So we use this as a two-way dialogue. My approach to the study of such artistic practices, which I outlined with colleagues in this special issue that um, some of you have seen, doesn't treat art and anthropology as exactly the same, however. Um, rather, I propose to say that artists and anthropologists are on speaking terms and therefore capable of productive dialogue, not in spite of, but precisely because of some of the differences of our ways of seeing. A second thing that I realized over time, and as I collaborated more closely with the people on this project, and this is a shot from this year's um, project, I'm not in a position really to theorize just for my interlocutors. Rather, I'm faced with partners who put forward their own reflexive agendas, which are often on similar, but sometimes on conflicting epistemological terrain. But rather, again, um, than seeing this as a problem or a conflict that needs to be bridged, I regard such encounters of intellectual self and other observation and mutual reflexivity as a productive challenge to think through the status quo and to anticipate the future of this kind of anthropological scholarship on the brink of experimentation. Um, so I could end here, but if I have a little bit more and if people are not yet falling asleep in a post-lunch nap-like um, situation, um, then I would just tell you a little bit more about how my current work has changed and in what ways this, um, there are still uh, common concerns. So since June 2016, um, I've been part of a multi-researcher comparative project called Making Differences in Berlin. I didn't come up with that pun. Um, housed at the Center for Anthropological Research on Museums and Heritage um, at the Humboldt University, funded by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and we investigate the changing museum landscape in Berlin at this very moment, focusing in particular on this slightly megalomaniac project, um, the so-called Humboldt Forum. Um, on the top image or rendering, you can see Berlin's central museum island, which is a long stretch that sort of, uh, just like Venice, I don't know why people do this, um, has been built on uh, very unstable ground. and. Um, <laughs> houses some of the most valuable collections and needs to be stabilized every day and uh, um, anyway and it's got um, some wonderful museums there's the border museum Arnold Border being one of the founders of the document at the very, very um, bottom left which houses wonderful sculptures in fact it also used to house um, a one million euro uh, coin a large golden coin worth one million euros that was donated by the Canadian government which sadly has been stolen <laughs> <laughs> about a month ago. So I'm not entirely sure how this happened. It wasn't me. Um, and, um, but anyway, it's, it's a beautiful museum still, and I'm hoping that they're going to find this back. Then you've got a railroad track that goes right through it, which is weird, but um, interesting. You've got the Pergamon Museum, which houses um, uh, the Museum of Islamic Art. You've got um, two national galleries. Then you've got the... It's You can't really see the size of it, uh, but sort of at the top bit in this in white... This is the um, burial cathedral of the Hohenzollern kings. It's a huge cathedral built on this island. Then you've got Unter den Linden, the famous boulevard that goes um, um, from Alexanderplatz to um, the Brandenburg Gate. And then <laughs> you've got um, a rendering at the bottom right. You see just some numbers. It's all in German, but it's going to be, again, over 41,000 square meters um, large. It's going to cost over 600 million euros. Um, uses over... 100,000 cubic meters of concrete, it says there, and all kinds of, it's a huge project essentially, um, that is, uh, that I'll explain, uh, just in a little bit more detail now. The Humboldt Forum, this thing, um, is one of Berlin's, if not Germany's most contentious cultural projects at the moment. Uh, Berlin, the European Union, and the German government is investing a vast sum of money in reconstructing one of its most central monuments to Prussian imperial heritage. Namely, and this is what this used to be like, of what this used to be, the Hohenzollern City Palace. 
um, which itself is going to house no longer just a represent, rep representative sort of uh, um, 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 space, but is going to house about four different museums including, and this is where the contentions uh, begin, the vast ethnographic collections of the city of Berlin, which are themselves amongst the biggest in Europe, and much of which has been collected during contentious periods of German colonialism that are reflected in the unfortunate architecture that they've chosen for this place. Um, and I think that the name Humboldt Forum, and this is what we're currently looking at, has been sort of an idea to try and find a term for this very strange um, uh, combination of a, pr a rebuilt Prussian castle into which you're putting the former Prussian collections. Um, anyway, uh, this is this is uh, this hugely contested project framed as the Humboldt Forum raises questions about how Berlin and to a large degree how uh, um, uh, how architecture functions um, sort of as a projection screen um, for German national identity and how Germany is dealing through a vast ethnographic museum project with its own past um, and how it projects its identity into the future. So some of us in the research team are therefore looking, for instance, into the difficult negotiations of provenance and the restitution of objects, since this museum and the collections contain, for instance, human remains that were collected um, uh, in Namibia, which was a German colony, um, and where the Germans committed, as many colonial empires um, did, um, um, atrocities and mass murder, and there are um, bits in this collection that people of our, some of our team are looking um, into the history of to find out whether there are claims potentially of restitution that might need to be addressed. Um, others of us are investigating the representation of Islam um, uh, in the Museum of Islamic Art, um, which of course is 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 a is a highly um, uh, timely topic with the influx of many um, uh, Muslims into uh, German society and fear of xenophobia. And yet others are looking into the history of the building and its relationship to the city. The project that I designed uh, within this larger undertaking is a kind of inside-out comparison. So I liaise closely, for instance, with the making of and consultation processes of the curators and designers of one section of the Humboldt Forum, namely the so-called Humboldt Laboratory, um, which is the official interface between the, this museum project and the Humboldt University. And you can see their modest um, 700 square meter section here in sort of an interactive plan highlighted in yellow at the bottom right, um, which is on the first floor of the facade that you see on the simulated image. So what I'm doing with uh, uh, in this project, which runs until the end of 2020, is to compare their processes, that is to say um, the processes of people in this museum, um, um, and their attempt to design a space for experimentation and the challenging of um, some problematic narratives of Eurocentric and selectively remembered history with the challenges leveled against this whole project by critical post-colonial art spaces and curators on the periphery of the city. So many of the galleries, curators and artists that I accompany as part of my research are extremely skeptical of Berlin's attempt, as they see it, to reconstruct Prussian imperial heritage in the center of the city, not only erasing the possibility of a monument to its socialist history, um, and I'm just showing these two because the top image shows you what the palace used to look like until World War II. It was built in the 15th century, um, gradually um, used for all kinds of different purposes, heavily destroyed during World War II. And then because this was Eastern Berlin, um, the socialist government decided to erase the, the ruins of this palace and build, and I'm, no judgment here, um, built... Um, the um, Palace of the Republic, which is essentially the seat of government of the GDR regime, which is the steel concrete um, block that you see at the bottom image. That, uh, in the 90s, after the fall of the wall, was seen to be so um, uh, asbestos-ridden that that was torn down again. And the, ge the German government then decided, um, based on a number of uh, uh, um, fundraising efforts by uh, a group of slightly conservative philanthropic um, aristocrats, to rebuild um, the new palace in the same architectural framework as the original Hohenzollern Palace. So you can sort of see that this is slightly absurd and raises all kinds of questions about what is really remembered, what is erased, especially if you're storing inside this museum, as I said, the collections that were taken um, from other countries during um, the imperial age. So anyway, as you can imagine, post-colonial art spaces are not too happy with this project especially since many of them are struggling with funding while this is being uh, funded um, at nearly a billion euros. Um, 
Anyway, I work with um, the Humboldt Forum and with curators in the rest of the city to try and just see in what ways this the engagement with ideas of otherness, since after all this museum is going to house so-called the, the cultures of the world, um, uh, how you can deal with German identity and German heritage uh, and how you curate it. Um, so what I've been able to, to, to follow in this past year is how critical galleries and curators are reacting to this project by developing their own anthropological revisions of this picture. For instance, through exhibition projects on white privilege or on continued colonial legacies in contemporary Germany, um, like the gallery of the Institute of Foreign Relations, which I'm showing here. So one of the three sites I work with um, is the communal gallery in Wedding, in one of Berlin's diverse northern districts, whose curatorial program, Unsustainable Privileges, and whose curator's pictures here, um, I accompany, observing and collaborati collaboratively participating in planning meetings, exhibition making, and public events. And as part of this project, I'm asking questions, for instance, about alternative notions of speaking about the distinction of the West and the non-West, that do not fall back on exoticized ideas of adventure um, um, as uh, the new city palace is doing uh, by renaming it in the name of the two Humboldt brothers. Um, and this begins with, but does not end with, an idea of space, for instance, which recognizes the rather obvious, but not always realized, issue that to attract a diverse set of people to engage with questions of diversity, it's not enough to create an exciting monument. You actually need to move yourself, get involved with, and turn and in turn involve people from the kinds of communities you're interested in speaking with. This is a project about um, Afro-German heritage in Berlin, for instance, in one of the galleries. Um, and just to conclude, one of the things that I've been involved in doing with these kinds of galleries um, is I'm just going to skip over some of this um, is creating, um, as in this case, this is um, this was one of the other spaces I work in. We invited Arjuna Paderai. Um, a professor of anthropology at NYU to speak, um, um, uh, and this this year is another set of events that I've, I'm curating in one of the galleries, which we called um, Gallery Reflections, but which sort of follows the idea that the anthropologist could become in these instances again not an outside observer, but actually part of the picture, part of the conversation, and in the words of uh, um, the Moroccan curator who I'm working with in this gallery. I, bis I essentially became her sparring partner. And I thought that that idea really neatly encapsulated, I felt, what I've been trying to achieve over the last few years. That is to say, a relationship, just sparring for those that don't know it, is essentially training in boxing, where you're a partner who also takes punches, but are in a sense sort of protected by the rules of a dialogue that you've deliberately facilitated to learn, to become stronger, and um, to speak to one another in dialogue. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jonas, for that fascinating talk. Uh, does anyone want to kick off some questions? Yes, David, and then Karun. Um. Thank you very much, Jonas. Uh, and <clears throat> I think it's probably on everyone's minds to, to commend you for bold academic work. Uh, your uh, willingness to insert yourself uh, is something that's obviously contentious in itself. And that's sort of the basis of the question I'd like to ask, which is going to start things off very politically heavily, so hopefully Karim will light it up. Um, <clears throat> I remember a Simpsons episode where the Simpsons family visits Berlin uh, out of nowhere. And they're on a tour bus around the city looking at architectural uh, uh, historical pieces. And at one point, Bart asks the tour guide, what happened between 1939 and 1945? And the tour guide says, nothing. Nothing happened in Berlin in those years. Those years didn't happen in Berlin. And, and the, the dialogue moves on, making light of it. And um, you make mention of some of the contentious issues surrounding this new project that you've engaged in, which I think is an astute concern. Mm. And so my two questions to you are, you know, to what extent might this project be considered historical revisionism, um, or even displacement in some ways? But more particularly, sorry, based did on you just say this project being the, the my project, one. or this yeah. one, this large museum project? This large museum okay, project. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but even more particularly, and I think more interestingly, because you insert yourself into your work, 
Um, to what extent might the involvement of a handsome, young, charismatic anthropologist, for example, be you know legitimizing these contentious issues that you raise? Is that are these political concerns to your project in any way? They absolutely are. I think the uh, I mean this was the starting point really for this whole project that people felt that this large museum undertaking is precisely. Um, um, uh, revisionism to some extent because for instance the Nazi period isn't as present as some people think it should be but then again um, and I can certainly confirm this having been brought up in the German system there is also the issue that um, almost everything in German um, uh, history museums essentially boils down to the Holocaust so it's some and, and actually in conversations with people from the Jewish museum in particular Curators there have been struggling to to get beyond um, the idea that everything has, leads up to the Holocaust, um, and this is a very difficult way of trying to think about temporal horizons when you're exhibiting and curating. Because how do you put yourself essentially into the um, into the zeitgeist of a different era without knowing the future? So we now, when we're creating museums or, or exhibitions that are dealing with the past, we see what has happened since and after certain um, time periods. So these are some of the ways in which um, uh, collaborations with the Jewish Museum, um, for instance, have helped us try to rethink these issues. But absolutely, I mean, it's it's hugely problematic. I think the more interesting point, because this other bit's been written about a lot, is really just how, as a white um, uh, male um, uh, European working on questions of non-European heritage, for instance, um, I I can actually, in a sense, speak and uh, work on these kinds of projects in a way that doesn't seem, as some people have actually said to me, legitimize and reproduce those kinds of Eurocentric narratives. And uh, I think there's no um, there's no uh, no denying that that is a risk. But at the same time, the alternative would be to leave some of the conflicted legacies of anthropology to its own and not actually to deal with some of the problems, to try and, as it were, project a different kind of idea of this discipline into the future. And in fact, one of the reasons why anthropology has been so marginalized in Germany is because it was taken up by the Nazis, in fact. It became a study of that legitimized racial differences and so on. And I feel that the only way to, to, to create a different kind of future is to take this into our own hands and show to others that we can think of it differently. Karim? So, <clears throat> I think um, uh, there's a few few aspects of your paper that I think are worth um, kind of building upon. One is this concept of Bildung in Germany, which I think for people in North America, maybe even in the UK, is, is, a, is a different concept there. It's sort of self-edification through culture and art. It's it's the sense that it's the state's role to create that space and actually, patro you know, the, the patronage of the state is really important. And one of the things that people may not know is the, the massive state funding for the arts in Germany. I mean, it's some, somewhere in the realm of, you know, on the, on the communal level and, and lender level, the provincial, somewhere in the realm of like, you know, over seven or eight billion euros a year. And then they also have international, uh, levels as well. And then, of course, the cities get involved and then, and other private foundations. So it's this massive amount. And this kind of relates to this, uh, legitimacy that, that, the, that, you know, um, public institutions are supposed to do this work. Um, but the question then always comes down to, and that's what I see this tension in your, in, in what you're saying as well, is it comes down to, well, what is the content? What is the knowledge? What is the self-knowledge that we're supposed to be deriving from this activity? And, and then, you know, well, who's, pay, you know, you have the conservatives and who's paying for this and what value are we getting? And so there's this kind of inbuilt oscillation between people who want to project some kind of a, an ob, I call it the object view of culture, which is sort of this culture is, is an, it's, it's a, it's a thing and it needs to be protected and it needs to be, um, cultivated and it's a source of um, harmony and it's a source of unity and and um, you know you need to value that and that is some is an illegitimate narrative and that's what you see in the sort of humble forum building but then you that slams up against you know the contemporary realities of both Europe and you know Germany's place within the global migration streams which you know see lots of different people coming to Germany and it's, you know, population, but different generations 
redefining what it means to be German. So Germany is no longer, uh, you know, just the veneration of this one kind of culture. Uh, it is, you know, the idea of, um, you know, being open to uh, the other. It's been, you know, questioning what, you know, what it means. Part of it, I think, is also the necessity to try to transcend some of that history and try to move on. There's sort of a sense that there's that, that, um, necessity there and working through it. So I, I really see that tension within, um, the, within German society that, that you have both quite legitimate needs. You have the need to have some degree of identity projected through this public spending and this bildung that is happening. Like, what are you actually doing? But then the content of that is quite problematic because you, you know, if you, if you can, if you say, okay, well, we're this cosmopolitan kind of open process oriented, um, people, um, it's very difficult for sort of the everyday person to really understand why we're spending all this money doing it. Um, so could you, <coughs> could you, could you write that down and send it to me? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, on, so, and I went to that, I've been to this gallery, actually, I met you in Berlin and, and I, right afterwards went to this gallery. I didn't realize you were there just that anyway, but, um, and I spent about three hours there. <laughs> And what I found, what I found most remarkable was actually this, um, it's kind of tying into some other things, was this exhibit of books. And all there were was books with bookmarks. And there were these incredibly horrible racist books. Um, some of them were just very comical. Uh, and they'd been sort of bookmarked. Um, so it was kind of like unearthing, like it's almost like this archaeology of like going back through that, you know, what would have been in the, in the consciousness of sort of maybe a, you know, a German kind of, I don't know, educated kind of person and looking at what are the, what are the stereotypes that they're seeing and kind of like, so you could sit in this sort of little room surrounded by these books and they'd been propped up and then bookmarked so you could kind of like open them up and take a look. Um, and that was oh, part right. of this other exhibit. There's a lot of really fun things in the exhibit, including a really hilarious kind of rule reversal video of these Africans coming to southern Germany and doing an ethnographic kind of look at these tribal Germans, which was hilarious. <laughs> um, but what I, found, what I found really interesting was sort of this need to try and find a way to work through this. Like, you, you, there's, there wasn't a you couldn't just kind of leave it. Like, it seemed like, and the, you know, in my research, German, the German kind of... Um, I guess cultural, cultural agents or cultural elite, they want to find a way to work through this problem that they have, uh, internally. Um, and they're coming up against, um, this object view of culture, right? Which I, I could juxtapose as object view of culture versus a process view. And they kind of say, well, actually, that's all well and good, but, you know, actually a society is strong because of its history and it's strong because of this, um, cohesion that culture brings and actually that's why we fund you know why we fund dance and museums and Pina Bausch you mentioned that I was like yeah right that's kind of like this very archetypical kind of German dance um, so I, I just wanted to say you know that was a really incredible presentation I'm wondering if you think just in relation to our <laughs> you know meaning making whether you think your intervention as a as an anthropologist is sort of like a, are you, do you see yourself as co-creating meaning and knowledge with these artists? Um, or do you really, see, cause you know, you're really inserting yourself in their process and you're really inserting yourself in your own history, right? You're not just kind of viewing it from the distance. So do you see yourself as kind of co-constitutive in that knowledge process? Are you part of the art? I think so. I mean, first of all, thanks for these great comments. I tried to write down as much as I could, because uh, that was really an interesting observation itself. Um, I certainly see myself as co-creating some of these, but I, I, I try and be explicit about the fact that I see this as an experimentation that, in a sense, inserts myself into these spaces, not so that I would study what I do then, because I think that would be a bit narcissistic, but really just to create a sort of tension, to see just how... You could, you could almost see it as a kind of strategy uh, or a method, perhaps, um, to, in, to use your own presence in a way to see just how institutions react to you and what kinds of things you unearth by, by being present and not trying to write yourself out of the picture. Um, 
But in most of these cases, I've been invited to, and that's been the, the method of keeping short, yeah. Um, we're running a little bit behind, so I'm going to take one question, and then I'm going to ask the final question. <laughs> so, Aaron. Uh, well, I'll take Aaron and Chara, then. Two questions. Uh, thanks very much. That was really, really wonderful, really stimulating. I'm, I'm so glad I was here to hear that. Very, very uh, um, profound. So thank you. Um, I wanted to relate it a little bit to um, similar issues in Canada, which I don't know you may or may not be aware of. Um, we're undergoing this enormous um, sea change, and I don't know a lot about it, so if other people know more, please step in. But I did want to raise it. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where um, we have a rather shameful past of uh, our dealings with our First Nations. And what's come out of that is a huge charge to museums, and that's why I thought it might be of interest to you if, you, if you're not aware of it. Um, it it's, uh, there's been a huge um, brief given to museums and cultural institutions to completely change their practices in light of this history. And what made me think of it during your talk is we have a, I have a colleague at uh, UVic, Andrea Walsh. She's in the anthropology department and she's heavily involved in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, it's a national uh, thing. She's also, um, does the kind of work that you're doing and which I would call community engaged scholarship where she works closely with First Nations communities on the island in, in Victoria and the peninsula. Um, and works in concert with them. She has a special space created where they come in. She works with elders. She works with um, First Nations uh, individuals. And she just did a recent show on residential school children drawings because that, that's that been the, 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 the this terrible legacy that we have to overcome in this country are those dreadful residential schools where children were taken from their homes and forced to go hundreds of miles away. And there's been terrible uh, social uh, social consequences of that. Um, and so I thought your your work made me think of Andrea Andrea's work. It made me think of community engaged anthropologists. Would you call yourself that? I'm not sure. Um, it's sort of a huge thing at UVic right now, community engaged scholarship. And then the final comment was in Canada now, it's becoming very difficult for non First Nations people to work on these issues um, is a sort of moral and ethical imperative that that um, that must be done by First Nations. So I'm not, again, it kind of co goes to the point that was made a little bit earlier. So. Tara, would you like to um, ask your question as well, and then uh, Jonas can try to answer both. Sure. Um, it's Funny, actually, because um, I was going to raise the fact that we're next weekend is um, Canada Day, and it's uh, Canada 150. Um, but there's a huge movement, um, so this is perhaps maybe the the opposite of the of the sort of positive framing that you're talking about around truth and reconciliation. There's an opposite movement around uh, decolonization. Um, and um, people who are resisting the idea that Canada is 150 years old, that in fact it's thousands of years old. <laughs> there were people here be before the settlers. Um, I actually was uh, just reminded of a couple projects that maybe you've seen. Um, I don't know if you were at the Berlin Biennale. It would have been not last year, but the year before, where uh, Juan Gaitan curated a bunch of artists in the Ethnographic Museum in Berlin. Um, and I'm curious if you saw that and, and if you thought that was a successful uh, intervention or not. Um, there were different performances, musical performances, uh, video installations, um, and it's a very problematic museum. It's very old school in terms of how they frame the other in their exhibits. Um, and then also um, this year's Documenta, um, the curators have chosen to take um, Documenta from its traditional home in Kassel in Germany, um, which was originally Documenta came about as a way of um, reclaiming um, the art ha that had been stolen from, um, you know, Jewish people. Um, and and so this year it's in Kassel, but also in Greece. And there's been a lot of 
criticism around, um, uh, I, I think it's, it's called, um, learning from Greece, uh, is what they've titled Athens, it. Athens, yeah. Uh, from Athens, learning from Athens. And it's, um, so the curators are, um, have gathered artists who are responding to the refugee crisis and the context there, but the criticism has been that um, it's speaking to the art world, the art tourists like some of us who would go and, um, you know, be entertained by the work, but it's not really speaking to the people of Athens. Mm. Some graffiti in Athens uh, just crossed out the L and made it earning from Athens, um, which is one of the... Uh, Actually, I was about to, I'll take these in reverse order, actually, and, and I'll try and keep it short, but I think we also start a little bit later, so hopefully that's, that's okay. Um, I think this question about, um, s s certain kinds of colonialism has been particularly interesting in Germany because some countries just would like to, um, uh, um, well, sort of just go over some periods of, um, uh, because other nations have been more imperial than they've been. So I, I sometimes feel that it comes down to the sort of the big nations that are seen as, as, as the most imperial and other sort of, um, uh, other histories are, are sort of written out because, I mean, the thing is Germany's done a lot of really terrible things. So it's kind of, <laughs> um, you know, there's so much that one really needs to revise and work on. Um, I haven't actually seen that particular piece in the Ethnological Museum, sadly. Um, but what's interesting about the Ethnological Museum in Berlin, uh, just really briefly, is that it used to be on the outskirts. And so one of the ideas for moving the museum uh, into the center of town is precisely to say that, look, you know, Germany isn't just about the great European painters. It's also about its relationships to the rest of the world. So really, to put the non-European collections um, uh, close to the free university, but not in the, uh, which is another big university, but not into the center of town, um, is sort of diverting attention to other issues, and we'd like to have it right in the center of town so that we can have those debates. Um, about the documenta, the reason why I've got this slide up is because Bonaventure Ndikung, um, who is um, curator of one of the sites that I work with very closely, is the curator at large of the current documenta, and um, we've been having lots of debates about this, the, 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 the idea that... Um, um, you know, the theme of this year's um, documenta is, is, as you said, learning from Athens, but a whole host of activities has been about trying to unlearn certain art historical canons that we, we're so used to. Um, and a lot of criticism has also been about the fact that people just felt like they didn't quite understand any of the artworks that were there. Um, and so some of the interesting conversations that we've been having have been about just what it actually means to be confronted with something you don't know. And how you deal with these in the context of such an established um, uh, um, exhibition project as Documenta, um, and I find that the relationship with Athens, um, where I'm actually going next week to see it finally, so I'm very curious to um, to speak to people there. A lot of people have felt that, particularly for a German exhibition project, to come to Athens and say that they want to learn something from it, um, seemed to them a bit cynical since Germany's been, you know, just um, essentially telling the Greeks what to do for such a long time. And obviously these things are now being um, put together so that we should now go and learn from them. But I do feel that in a lot of these debates, the question is one of scale. So questions about European financial stability are then brought into um, a situation where this guy, Bonaventure, who's been struggling in Berlin to try and bring artists from other parts of Europe, Southern Europe, from other parts of the world, to get their recognition or get recognition for their work in Berlin, that he's now being accused of being a colonialist, um, being Cameroon-born and, and having faced racism in Germany for his whole life. So it, I sometimes feel that things get muddled up a little bit too much and the different scales um, intersect. But I'd like to speak to you more about this um, rather than that. Oh, I just Thank want to finish you. with a question that isn't really about your paper, but it's something that I'm curious about and uh, 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 about you know, the differences between art history and anthropology. A mm. um, couple of years ago, of course, I embarked on this uh, book about uh, an art historical account of Jeffrey Rubinoff. And I just wonder how you as an anthropologist would have gone about that project differently. What would have been your methodology if you had been asked uh, to do a study of Jeffrey Rubinoff while he was still alive? How would you have gone about it? Should I answer that in one sentence now? Is that, I mean, that's a, I, frankly, I feel that I would have to come back to answer that question properly. Um, I, um, 
I think one of the most compelling moments perhaps has been that right after Karun's wonderful tour, uh, we went into the, into the studio. Um, and I felt that while I don't want to reduce, and I think we've been having some discussions about this over the course of these two days, I don't want to reduce, um, the appeal of an artwork or the appeal, uh, of an artist just to the production of it or just to the reception of it. I think all of these, um, must be integrated in our reception of it. But really just to see, the incredible effort that has gone into um, producing some of these sculptures and in crafting this landscape. I mean, James tried to lift a few of those um, um, very playful looking, very playful looking um, um, metal balls, and really, um, <laughs> and at that point, I think at that point, I think you got an understanding just of how differently one might see this landscape that looks so light and so so beautiful and so 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 drawn by hand but actually it was crafted in 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 in, in very different kinds of ways so i think i would have loved to have explored um the craftsmanship that has really gone into this whole um, enterprise thank you very much thanks thanks jonas <laughs>Yeah, so we'd like to just say a few closing remarks. So this brings the, the forum to the company of ideas to a close. I think we've had two really wonderful days. I think it's been all of these things that we understand as a company of ideas where, of course, we have the six talks, but then we have these long breaks. We've had one, we've been doing wonderful things. Of course, the stargazing, the dinners, the walks, the tours, where, uh, as Jonas just mentioned, some of these talks got discussed, remade on the go in, in one case. <laughs> um, and um, I think that we often, when people present talks, I think what gets forgotten is that people, of course, get a lot of feedback and go away and rework them. And I think that in this case, uh, this, this will definitely happen. So just to sum up some of the, of the themes of the forum, I think that it's incredibly important that e to note that even though uh, that being set here at the Jeffrey Rubin of Sculpture Park, I think one thing lives on. These ideas that Jeffrey felt uh, passionately about, for example, the art in conversation with the broader Enlightenment tradition, so this relationship between art and scientific thought. So this is something that we saw addressed, for example, in Brandon Taylor's talk when he talked about the way in which some of the impulses in the 19th century or earlier uh, scientific anthropological thinking could potentially lead to all kinds of taxonomies and classifications, whereas art, if you like, inserts that sense of moral conscience, which is what uh, Jeffrey was interested in. Um, moving on, say, to a completely different way of doing art, a case of performance art, uh, where it bleeds into something more like creative pedagogy or creative working with children, we, I think, again, see this theme of art resisting a dominant way of thinking, a scientific way of thinking, if you like, which is something that was then addressed by Catherine in her talk. Um, we asked, I think, this question, which we have come across with the sculptures again and again, how do we, as observers of work, happen to co-create, how do we as observers, as writers, as art historians, discuss the work and create a kind of web of knowledge or a web of interpretation around that. So Sam Rose talked about that in the relationship between, uh, on, on the subject of the relationship between the modernist and the so-called postmodernist tradition of criticism. But we have also addressed questions of distance and closeness. So we saw with Jonas how uh, there is another alternative to art writing, to the kind of writing that most of us in this room do, I think, one which is much more situated in the context, uh, doing the kind of deep hanging out, as you <laughs> described it as, a, as an anthropological method. And we have also moved across the 20th century, flanking, uh, if you like, the kind of sculptural production that we see here, moving from uh, vorticists and early avant-garde work discussed by Alan Antliff, uh, relayed, of course, by Aaron, um, and surrealist cubist work discussed by Brandon, down to the very new, uh, exciting, and potentially, as we discussed, uh, dangerous developments even, or uh, perhaps both, that, that Meredith uh, brought up in such a discursive way, which I think got, got us into a really stimulating debate. So... I think this topic of art and knowledge in the first of what will be uh, three more forums, I think I'm, I'm, I'm very glad and I'm very grateful 
uh, of course, to James for, for inviting me to co-convene this with him. Um, we also have a couple of thanks. So I'll begin by thanking, uh, of course, six of our wonderful speakers. So Jonas, Meredith, Sam, Brandon, uh, Catherine, Alan, who, who's not here, and to Aaron Campbell, who has, as I said, read it all out. So let's thank them again. Um, our students from UVic, you've asked such pertinent questions and uh, such direct questions. Uh, I've been speaking to you about your work during the breaks. Um, I've, you know, I feel like I've, I've learned from you from some of the, um, you know, very, very pertinent remarks and the subject that you're dealing with are incredibly pertinent and, um, you know, cutting edge. So, Astara, David, Dana, Nelly, Shanice, Abby, and of course, Marlo, who will be, uh, accompanying us tonight on jazz. So, thanks to all of you as well. It gets the sort of intellectual thank, thank yous. I get the log logistical thank yous. But I would like to begin by thanking our stargazers last night. You know, it's, it wasn't just tremendous fun, but I think it was something that felt very much in, 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 in the, the spirit of Jeffrey. Jeffrey, you know, art is obviously very much about trying to find a place for yourself in the world. And Jeffrey was fascinated in, in the cosmos and all those things. So it felt like uh, something he would have loved us to do. So thank you very much for having us last night. So, round of applause. I also want to thank John and John sitting over on the sides there. It's not been an easy six months. I think the winter has been very hard. The spring was bad. So it's been an absolute miracle that you've turned the park into, into such a beautiful place uh, in time for the conference. It's looking as, as good as I've ever seen it. So congratulations to them for making this place so good. And of course, we have to thank Karun. Uh, you know, conferences, as, as, as many people probably on this side of the table realize and around conferences are very difficult things to organize. They're very time consuming. Imagine trying to do that on an island, you know, hundreds, thousands of miles away from many of the speakers. You know, it's an extremely challenging logistical task to get everything here. Do all of these things have to come on to the island, Karun? The, the monitors, the sound recording, the cars, the delegates, it's float planes, it's international flights, it's absolutely everything. And Karun, every year, does it absolutely brilliantly and, and isn't only a fantastic organizer, but he's great, great company. He still makes time to, to drink drive, uh, <laughs> and to, and, and to be a fan, juice only, <laughs> and to be a, a fantastic member of the forum and contributor to the discussion. So thank you, Karim. And, and of course, we must thank Betty and the family. Uh, you know, it's, of course, not been an easy six months for you, and it would have been uh, absolutely understandable if you didn't want to have a forum uh, this year and take a bit of time time away. It's extremely tiring for you. This is, after all, your home, and you're having all these this gaggle of people coming coming and being here. And you and you, uh, Betty does a lot of the organisation behind the scenes. She's organising the food and a whole range of other things. And it's um it's so good to be here, uh, Betty. Thank you very much for having us. So can we please give the largest round of applause? to Betty.